Well, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Make yourself at home. Have a drink. While I give some attention to some underappreciated characters and storylines that I personally love. And I hope you grow to love as well. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back. Today we are reading Swamp Thing number 118. And just a little catch up on what's been going on. In the last issue, the gang went to Mardi Gras, had a, had a bit of fun. Swamp Thing followed a weird jester into a back alley. And then uh, found out it was actually like some kind of satyr that's a god of misrule. And Swamp Thing talked to him and found out that he wasn't really evil or anything. It was just he was celebrating his day because it was Mardi Gras. And he leaves Swamp Thing kind of mentioning that he's his brother. Uh, which I don't quite understand, but maybe they'll explain later on. Also in the issue, we met some new characters. There's a guy named Carl who went to Mardi Gras with them because he's a friend of Chester. And uh, yeah, Carl's kind of important because in Swamp Thing Annual 6, which I did not read for the podcast because I didn't know it was important, uh, his boyfriend came to town and ended up being killed uh, for being gay and thrown into the swamp. And where his body was thrown in the swamp, just happened to be where a bunch of other people had thrown bodies as well. It was a convenient place under a bridge, uh, I guess, to throw a body. So under some kind of magic, we don't really know how, the four bodies that were in this area amalgamated into one giant monster, and it's been kind of terrorizing people throughout uh, this run so far. And when we see it, it's usually because this monster runs into one of the bad people uh, that killed one of the victims that make up this monster. And we've seen three of these victims get their closure, I guess, by killing the person that killed them. So there's one last victim that we haven't uh, got closure for, uh, and that is a child in Swamp Thing Annual number six. There was a boy who was kidnapped by a child murderer, and that is how he ended up dead in the swamp and amalgamated into this monster. So first things first with issue 118, we got the cover here. We see Swamp Thing is standing on top of some sort of little hill and there's a bird surrounding his head. And then also in the background, we see these big plant-like monsters coming up. One of them has sharp teeth and the others just look kind of humanoid, but their faces are made of roots and stuff. So they still look pretty uh, horrible. And we see that this issue was written by Nancy A. Collins and the art is by Scott Eaton and Kim DeMolder. And we start off on the first page. We see baby Tefe in her crib inside the swamp house. She is sleeping and all of a sudden someone calls out her name. So she wakes up and this voice is saying, come out and play. Come play with us, Tefe. Don't tell the grownups. They wouldn't understand. So Tefe gets up and she crawls out of her crib and walks past her mom and dad who are asleep. And she walks out the front door and as she gets outside, she looks at everybody and she's not scared or anything. She waves and says, hi everybody. And we can't see them. But on the next page, we see the reveal that there are a bunch of fun little characters. There's some Raggedy Ann looking guy. There's Peter Pan. There's, I don't know, Cabbage Patch Kids or something. Kermit the Frog, uh, Dorothy and the Cowardly Lion and the Tin Man. And there's a camel. I don't know what that's from. <laughs> there's also a Dancing Daisy and some sort of Muppet. And even though it's nighttime, it looks all bright and cheery where they are, and they're all yelling, Hi, Tefe! And we see the name of this issue is A Child's Garden. So Tefe runs off the porch and goes to play with these imaginary friends, I'm assuming. They are very happy to see her, and it seems like they've all met before, and this isn't the first time they've played together. So the Raggedy Ann doll puts Tefe on top of the camel, and they begin to walk deeper into the woods. And one thing that's interesting is Tefe is talking to these people. They're asking her questions like, Are you having fun, Tefe? And she's saying, Oh yes, lots. So she's communicating in full sentences, which we haven't really seen so far in the series. So as they reach the edge of the deep woods, someone is leaning against a tree and we see it is Peter Pan. And he starts talking to Tefe saying, don't you want to know what our new adventure is, Tefe? And she says, oh yes, tell us, Peter. Tell us what our adventure is. And the other characters with her are also chanting, oh yes, tell us, Peter, tell us. So Peter Pan stands up tall in front of all these people and we see Tinkerbell like flying around him, but she's not really detailed or anything. So she just kind of looks like a firefly. And uh, Peter Pan says, we're going to the land of gobble you ups to rescue Princess Pretty Pretty from the evil King Thundermug. And when Peter says this, all the characters look at Tefe and they kind of give like a shocked face. And even Tefe looks scared and they all go, ooh. And then Peter keeps on explaining, 
We'll have to cross the burning desert and the ocean of shed tears and climb the rock candy mountains. But the biggest thing we have to worry about is the bad man. And all the characters gasp in fright and Tefe just kind of looks dumbfounded and says, the bad man. And as she says this, all the characters begin to run away scared. And as they run, she says, where's everybody going? Who's this bad man? And then Peter looks at her and says, maybe you should ask the Lost Boys. And then he points behind him with his thumb. So Tefe walks over to the Lost Boys and they begin to tell her about the bad man. And they say, the bad man steals kids from their parents. He pretends to be their friend, but it's just a trick. Then he gets them alone. He eats them up, hair, guts, and all. And Tefe asks, how come you know so much about the bad man? And then out of the woods, we see some dead children appear and they all say, because he ate us all up. Beware of the bad man, Tefe. Don't let him eat you too. And then Tefe gets a feeling that something bad is behind her. And then a shadow comes over her and the Lost Boys run away and they begin to yell, here he comes, run, run. And in the artwork, Tefe is like engulfed in a shadow. It looks like maybe there was a man standing behind her. But as she turns, we see there's not, it's just a tree that is in front of a setting sun. And on top of that tree is a raven we have seen before. It is Matthew the Raven from Sandman. And he lands on the top of that tree and he begins to talk to Tefe saying, where'd everybody go? Was it something I said? And Tefe doesn't know him. So she says, are you the bad man? And Matthew answers, not for some time, sweetie. Say, what's your name, honey? And she tells him and he says, I thought you looked familiar. Welcome to the dream, Tefe, part of your human heritage. And then all of a sudden a voice calls out, Matthew? And then Matthew the Raven says, Oops, business calls. It was nice meeting you, Tefe. Give your mother my love. And he flies back to the castle of Morpheus because it turns out Tefe has been dreaming and she is in the realm of the Sandman. And also, if you didn't know, the Raven Matthew from Sandman is actually a character named Matthew Cable from Swamp Thing who used to be Abby's husband. So as Matthew flies away, all of a sudden Tefe is awoken by her mom, Abby, who is waking her up in the morning. And after that dream, Tefe is not very happy this morning. She's being very fussy and not cooperative as Abby tries to feed her. So Abby has Tefe in a high chair and she's saying, honestly, Tefe, what's gotten into you today? And Tefe's yelling, no, don't wanna. And Swamp Thing's there and he says, I guess this is what the parenting books refer to as the terrible twos. And as Abby wipes Tefe's face, she says, that's what I'm afraid of. And Tefe's only 20 months old. Come on, Tefe, don't you want to eat some yummy strained apricots? And Tefe refuses to eat, shutting her mouth tight. So Abby gives up and Swamp Thing comes over and he picks Tefe up and he says, perhaps she is simply not ready to eat. Maybe if she plays outside, it will help her appetite. You're driving your mother crazy. Do you know that? And Tefe looks at him very happily as he picks her up and she says, yay. And he smiles and says, I thought so. So he takes Tefe to somewhere in the swamp. We don't know how far it is from the house, but it's probably not that far, but you definitely can't see the house in any of these panels. So as Swamp Thing sets her down, he says, there you go. Why don't you play while mama gets things cleaned up? And just as he sets her down, Alec hears Abby call him from the house saying, Alec, can you come here for a second? I need some help in the kitchen. And as this is going on, we see in the panels, in the water nearby, there's like an alligator. So, so Swamp Thing is just about to leave Tefe next to this dangerous area. And we also see in the woods lurking, there is that monster that is made up of the four victims who were thrown off the bridge in the swamp. So Swamp Thing just leaves Tefe here and he says, you stay right here, understand? Daddy will be right back. So he walks away and instantly the amalgamation monster comes out right in front of Tefe and its mouth is open, it's salivating. And I think I've described this thing before, but it's basically like a giant purple spider, but instead of eight legs, it's got like a bunch of different legs and arms because it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different people. It's got four heads, but they don't have necks. It's like their heads are lined up in a row and the mouths where they meet make up the top jaw of this monster as well. So it's got a big old tongue. It starts opening its mouth and it's thinking to itself, kill, kill, kill. And that's kind of a mantra it has. It always says kill, but I guess as it looks at Tefe, it assesses her and realizes that she is innocent. And then Tefe hands it one of her Raggedy Ann dolls and she says, play. And the monster takes it into one of its many hands 
and it looks at it and then it hands it back to Tefe and it thinks to itself, no kill. And then something interesting happens. The monster kind of fades into the background and out of it comes the ghost of a boy. And the boy looks kind of shy and he looks at Tefe and says, you can see me, can't you? I can tell. You're not scared like the others. I wish I knew what's happening to me. I'm so cold all the time and I'm so lonely. There used to be other people in here, two guys and a lady, but I don't hear them anymore. Maybe they went away. And what this ghost boy is talking about is he was one of the four people that made up this amalgamation monster. And apparently as this monster has been going through the series and killing the people that killed it, so it's getting its revenge, the souls of the trapped victims are able to leave. So if you look at the four heads on this monster, there's only one of them with eyes that are solid now. All the rest of them have hollow faces. And then the ghost boy comes over to Tefe and he like pats her on the head. And it looks like Tefe is reaching out to give him a hug. And he says, I know you're only a little kid, but it's nice to be able to talk to someone again. I wish I knew what it was I did bad. I promise I'll never do it again. And then the ghost boy is interrupted by Abby yelling for Tefe from the house. And he begins to go back into the monster and then the monster and as Abby walks up, the monster is walking back into the woods. So Abby doesn't see it and she's not terrified or anything. She just picks Tefe up and she says, there you are. Let's get back to the porch where mama and daddy can keep an eye on you. But it seems like Tefe maybe wanted to hang out with that monster some more because she begins to cry and she doesn't stop even when they get back to Swamp Thing on the porch. And it seems like Abby's just had it with Tefe today. She says, well, aren't we being just a regular boiled sprat today? And I'm not sure why Abby said boiled sprat instead of spoiled brat. Maybe she doesn't want Tefe to know that she called her a spoiled brat. Anyway, as Abby's walking with Tefe, she sees their newly gotten kitten on the ground and she tries to get Tefe to play with it. So she puts Tefe on the ground next to the kitten and immediately Tefe grabs the kitten's tail and it must have hurt because the cat hisses and then the cat reaches out and scratches Tefe on the face. And Tefe begins to cry and she says, bad kitty. Her Tefe. And as she says this, the kitten's body turns inside out. And you might remember that something like this has happened before, specifically in Doug Wheeler's run, when Tefe and Abby were kidnapped by some bad people, Tefe was able to turn these bad men inside out. And that is because she's not only part elemental and part human, she is also part demon. Because her dad was John Constantine, when Swamp Thing took over John's body, he was unaware that John had just gotten a blood transfusion from a demon. So when Abby got pregnant from Swamp Thing in John's body, he unknowingly made Tefe part demon. So Tefe is one third demon, one third human, and one third plant elemental by my math. I might be wrong, I don't know the exact concentrations. So anyway, like I said, this cat turns inside out and this was done right in front of Abby and Swamp Thing. And Abby is horrified by what she's just seen. She says, Alec, oh my God, Alec, she did that deliberately. And Swamp Thing, who's also in shock, says, I was afraid something like this would happen. And as they look in horror, we also see that the kitten is still alive, even though it's inside out. It's in pain, obviously, and it's meowing. And Abby begins to cry and looks at it and says, Alec, the poor thing's still alive. Do something. So Swamp Thing reaches down and snaps its neck, and then he picks it up and begins to absorb it into his body. And Abby says, Alec. That was no accident. She meant to hurt that kitten. And Swamp Thing says, she's just a child, little more than a baby. And Abby kind of snaps back at this saying, you don't understand. That could have easily been another child. I'd hoped what happened in the rainforest when those horrible men hurt me was just a fluke. Alec, I can teach her to talk and eat with a fork and learn how to read, but how do I teach her how to control her powers? And Swamp Thing responds, I do not know but there are those who do. And Abby replies, Alec, you're not thinking of going to them, not after everything that's happened. And Swamp Thing answers, I'm afraid I have no choice but to consult the parliament. And then without any more discussion between them, Alec's body begins to collapse as his spirit goes into the green and Abby's yelling at him, Alec, no, don't go. And as his body collapses, he says, do not worry. I will not be gone long. Then we cut to the Amazon in the Parliament of Trees where Swamp Thing is growing his new body. But something is wrong. As he arrives, he thinks to himself, Odd, 
I was aiming for the center of the inner house, at the base of Yggdrasil, not the outer house. And what he's talking about is in the center of the Parliament of Trees is where the three elder trees live, and they are Yusigdril, Aeum, and Turu. And they kind of know more about everything than the rest of the trees. So that's why Swamp Link was going here to talk to them. But for some reason, even though he was aiming for the inner house, he ended up growing in the outer house. So as he questions this, one of the trees says, So, you have returned to us once more, Prime Founder. Have you decided to sink your roots this time? And Swamp Thing says, You know better than to ask me that. And the tree responds, Then why are you here? And Swamp Thing says, That's between me and Yggdrasil. And the tree replies, We fear that will not be possible. And Swamp Thing angrily looks at the tree and says, What? How dare you? If not for me, your founders wouldn't even exist. So we see the Parliament of Trees as being as antagonistic as it usually is, especially since Swamp Thing just saved them from the gray, which you would think they would be more appreciative. So the tree snaps back at Swamp Thing saying, you forget yourself, Alec Holland. While yours was the seed from which the founders grew, they possess wisdom acquired from eons of service to the green. Wisdom you lack. Compared to them, you are but a sapling. The father tree sends his days contemplating his dual nature as emissary between the gray and the green. He no longer speaks directly to the parliament, relaying his messages through Turu, and it was made clear that there would be no more distractions. Founder's Grove is off limits to you, at least for the time being. If you have any questions, ask them of us. So Swamp Thing begrudgingly says, it, It's about my daughter, Tefe. And the tree replies, Ah, yes, the child. We thought as much. Has she killed again? And Swamp Thing gets mad again and says, No, I, I mean, yes, it was, it was just a kitten, a family pet. But this time, it was no accident. She deliberately harmed the cat. The tree replies, We see. And what is it you would wish us to do? And Swamp Thing replies, Show me how to teach her right from wrong how to use her abilities wisely not to hurt and the tree answers the child is meat and as such she is heir to its passions and flaws a certain amount of cruelty is inherent in the species it cannot be erased and swamp thing says are you saying there is no hope in trying to teach her to control her power and the tree responds we have said no such thing. We simply stated that the child's human nature makes such tutoring time-consuming. Leave us, Alec Holland. The Parliament shall take your request under counsel and debate what is to be done. You shall hear from us soon. And then it's almost like they kick Swamp Thing out because his body just collapses and he goes back into the green. And as he's zooming through the green, he sees all the other faces of all the past Swamp Things that are part of the Parliament in the green as well. And they are talking, saying, You all heard the Founder's predicament. What does the Parliament suggest? The child requires a tutor, a guide. Cannot the Holland Founder do this thing? He is still the Green Soul Champion. For him to focus too much time and attention on his successor could prove dangerous for both him and the Green. Then who amongst us volunteers to teach the child? And then we see in the parliament outside of the green, a female form standing in shadow, and she is saying, I would teach the child should the parliament allow. And the parliament answers her, Ah, lady, the role suits you. But it seems like maybe Swamp Thing missed that because even though he was in the green, uh, she said that outside of the green. So possibly he missed that. I'm not sure if he did or not. But then we come back to his house in Louisiana where his body begins to grow again. And he says, Abby, I'm back. But then as he goes through the house, he doesn't get any response. And he calls out Abby again. And then he finds a note on the dinner table. And as he opens it, he sees it's from Abby and it says, Darling, I couldn't stand being in the house after you left. I've taken Tefe into town for some shopping and to try to put some space between me and what happened this morning. We should be home before dark. I love you. And then for some reason, as Swamp Thing finishes the note, he looks very angry, kind of, and he crumples it up. 
So I'm not sure if he's like mad at Abby or if he's just mad at the situation with the parliament. So then we cut to Huma where Abby is shopping in one of the supermarkets and everything's going fine. She's just going through her list. We see Tefe is sitting in the child seat inside of the shopping cart. And then someone calls out to Abby and she turns around and sees Carl standing there. If you don't remember, Carl is the young gentleman who joined them when they went to Mardi Gras and he had a pretty good time. He was there because his boyfriend was murdered for being gay by some homophobic people. And Carl had come down here to try to find his boyfriend. And his boyfriend was actually part of that amalgamation monster from earlier. But he had already gotten revenge on the guy that killed him, so he was no longer inside that monster. So anyway, Carl comes up and says hi to her. We see there's also a tall African-American man walking with him, and it turns out they're kind of going out together now. They met in the Mardi Gras issue as well, and his name is Troy Washington. And Carl introduces her to him, and as Abby shakes his hand, she says, I remember you from Mardi Gras, but we weren't properly introduced. So when Abby saw them, they were kind of a little bit far away, not too far, but like I said, she walked over there to shake his hand and then they began to talk and Tefe is still in the basket, maybe like 10 or 15 feet away from them. And we get a couple panels of her sitting by herself, kind of looking bored. And then we see the shadow of a man looming over her and we hear a voice say, my, aren't we a pretty little girl? How would you like to come home with me, sweetie? And then he holds up a piece of candy and Tefe gets very excited at the candy and he says, I thought so. Then we get to Abby who's finishing up the conversation with Carl and Troy. Oh, I should also mention that Carl is Chester's roommate. So Abby says goodbye to them and also tells them to say hi to Chester for her. And then she looks at her list again and goes, hmm, I wonder where they hide the baking soda around here. What do you think, Tefe? And then she turns to the basket and sees Tefe is gone and Abby drops the list. And then we cut to the inside of the truck where we see the man is driving away with Tefe. And Tefe has like chocolate all over her face like she's been eating candy like crazy. There's a bag of Hershey's Kisses in front of her. She's also playing with a toy truck. So it seems like this guy knows what he's doing. And he says to her, you'll like your new home. You'll have all the toys and candy you ever wanted. Plus a brand new big brother. Doesn't that sound fun? Then we cut to the swamp and we see the amalgamation monster just walking through the water and we get some narration and it says, once there were other voices inside him. They even had names, Bill, Tiger, Carmen. Sometimes the other voices were confused or sad or frightened, but mostly they were mad. Tommy didn't like it, but at least he wasn't alone. But one by one, the voices started fading away, growing weaker and weaker until Tommy found himself alone again. The others are gone, but the anger is still there, still inside him, making it hard to think. But if he really tries, he can remember. He can remember the bad man. And then we get some flashbacks of Billy and his childhood. So we see him with his parents all happy. Then we see him getting lured away by a man. Then we see him at like a carnival with the man having fun. And then we see him tied up in the trunk of a car. And there's narration over these scenes and it says, he used to have parents, a mama and a daddy. He's pretty sure of that. He's also sure they loved each other. There was a man, a stranger. He seemed friendly. He offered to take Tommy to the circus. And the circus was really fun. What came later wasn't. That's when Tommy learned the stranger was a bad man. The bad man would tell people Tommy was his son. And no one asked questions. And then we get a panel of the car pulling up to a motel. And then we cut inside the motel room and we see the man sitting in the chair watching Tommy sleep on the bed. And the narration continues. The bad man said he just wanted to be Tommy's friend, that he didn't want to hurt him, but he did anyway. And whenever Tommy cried, the bad man hurt him even more. And one day, while the bad man was out stealing a new car, Tommy tried to escape and he almost made it. Two days later, he finally let Tommy out of the trunk. And under that narration, we get the panels of him escaping and him trying to make a phone call. And then we see a panel of the bad man's car pulling up to a bridge. And then we see the man pulling Tommy out of the trunk and he's saying, I gave you your chance, Tommy. You should have been nice to me like I told you to. But no, you had to go and be a bad boy. So it's all your fault. You shouldn't have tried to run away. You really hurt my feelings. Friends don't tell the cops on one another. I can't trust you anymore, Tommy, and trust is very important to me. It's your fault I have to do this. And as the man's talking, we're seeing him pull Tommy out of the trunk, 
and bring the boy over to the edge of the bridge. And Tommy is still tied up fully. He's got his hands and legs both bound and tape over his mouth. And then we see the man throw Tommy into the water. And it's not a super high bridge. It's maybe 20 to 25 feet. But Tommy lands in the water. And of course, he can't swim because he's all tied up. And as Tommy begins to sink, he thinks to himself, Mama, Daddy, help me. I want to go home. I want to go home. And then we cut back to the amalgamation monster that is now Tommy as he's been reincarnated. And the amalgamation monster is sitting on a bank and it's crying because this is Tommy thinking about how he died. And as he's crying, all of a sudden, the monster catches the smell of something and it thinks to itself, wait, that smell. Yes, it's his smell. He is here somewhere in the swamp. Kill, kill, yes. And as the monster is saying this, it seems to be getting madder and madder, and it begins to run in the direction of the smell. Then we cut to the inside of Swamp Thing's house, where Swamp Thing is chilling in his self-grown lazy boy waiting for Abby to get back. And all of a sudden, he hears Abby yelling, Alec! Alec! So he goes outside to see what's going on, and Abby's running up to him, and we see she's not alone. She has come here with some police officers, and Swamp Thing says, Abby, what is wrong? Why are the police with you? And Abby runs into him and hugs him while she's crying and saying, Alec, it's Tefe. She's been kidnapped. And when Swamp Thing hears this, the look on his face is just of pure anger. And it seems like he is definitely going to track this kidnapper down if Tefe doesn't turn the man inside out by herself. And that is the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And remember to stay swampy.